بسم الله والحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وأصحابه ومن تبعهم بإسان إلى يوم الدين وبعد السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته. So tonight, inshallah, Taala, we have a special program uh, for you, and uh, we're calling this the Friday Show with John Starling. Our special guest uh, we have with us tonight, one of South Jersey's very own, Tom Fasheen. Uh, Tom here is uh, well known to many of you of the community and uh, is a friend of GCLEA, was once the youth uh, director, if you will, youth coordinator. And so perhaps your sons uh, may know him more than you do. But tonight we're going to uh, ask a few questions about his experience, uh, his journey to Islam, basically from Audubon High School right here in South Jersey uh, to Vassar College, uh, graduating uh, in political science, um, searching around to complete higher studies, a master's program he was trying to apply for in uh, Islamic and religious studies, and then his journey to uh, the holy city of the Prophet Sallallahu al Madina al Nabawiyah, and his enrollment in the Islamic University there. Um, so what we have tonight is a great opportunity to get some insight uh, into uh, what it's like to live in that city, to study there, uh, to mingle with the locals, the scholars, and the uh, the general population as well as um, some experiences uh, from one of our own here from the state. We're going to give everybody an opportunity to also ask their questions if the questions I have prepared uh, did not uh, meet the mark or if there's something that you want to ask. If you would like to send your question, uh, you can log in now where you're sitting onto our Facebook page. That's facebook.com slash the GCLEA. And you'll find there uh, an entry that says the Friday show with John Starling. Live, recording live. And you can post your questions in the comments. And I'll check that when it gets time for uh, your questions, uh, unless my questions uh, are sufficient. And if you want, we will uh, take any questions written down and then possibly uh, give you a chance to take the floor to ask questions uh, directly to our brother here, Tom. So, to begin, uh, first and foremost, most of us here were curious to know a little bit about the summary, uh, summarized version of your journey uh, due to Islam. Uh, yeah, it has to necessarily be a summarized version because People often look for a particular moment, right, that, that so, sort of uh, symbolizes the entire conversion process, and it's just impossible. I mean, it takes so long, and there's so many factors that go into it for every single person, depending on their makeup, depending on how, if they're more intellectually bent, or depending on their interests. So it's going to be a very, very condensed, condensed version. Um, I think my story and my trajectory mirrors a lot of experience of youth in America, especially uh, especially when it comes to religion. So I was raised uh, going to church every Sunday in a Presbyterian church. My father was a Catholic, my mother was a Presbyterian. Um, I began by being very devout, and during my teenage years, I became more and more distant from it to the point where I rejected religion entirely. Uh, to the point where I became, later in, in college, I kind of started feeling there was a void and trying to fill that void. And I, I'm guessing that most of you who interact with non-Muslims on a daily basis are familiar with this kind of trajectory. A lot of Americans are searching for something. They feel a void in their lives and they're, they're looking to fill it. Uh, different kinds of people turn to different things, uh, whether it's other uh, ideologies, or religions, or even things uh, more 
more along entertainment or, or lifestyle than that. But I think it's safe to say that most people follow that trajectory, in my experience, from America. They're, they're searching for something. So I was one of those people. And I didn't really know anything about Islam. The first time I'd even heard about Islam or Muslims was 9-11, of course. Uh, and that kind of put a lot of people in America in conversation with Islam, whether they wanted to be in conversation with it or not. Um, but it's never, never really something that I, I thought about until I got to college. When I met people from different places, for some reason I always seemed to, to make friends easily with people from abroad, people from different places. And I became friends with a few Muslims, and I had a, a professor who was Muslim. And at this time I was kind of searching for things, and it just became apparent to me, it struck me, the, the few things that I came in contact with from the Islamic tradition uh, seemed to, to, fill some, to fulfill something that had never been fulfilled. It seemed to provide answers for things that I had never had answers to before. Um, and that was the, the start of something. And the more I went, and the more I researched, and the more I looked into it, and this is a process that took years, I slowly became more and more convinced and dedicated. And I started trying out things, I started trying out worship, I tried to, to pray, I tried to fast, I had no idea what I was doing. And eventually it got to the point where I became convinced enough where I decided to, um, to make it mine, to, to become a Muslim, officially. So what were some of the, if you don't mind me interrupting you, what were some of the uh, specifics that uh, you found in your study of Islam? First, let me ask, were you familiar with Christianity? You said you went to church, uh, but were you familiar with uh, the teachings of Christianity or were just a regular uh, silent and unengaged attendee? I was familiar, more familiar than most. I mean, I was always in the Sunday school classes. I was always asking questions. My mom used to actually tease me. She said that I better become a lawyer when I was older because I always like to argue with people and I always like to find out what was at the bottom of something. Uh, so I was always at the top of my Sunday school classes. I was always the good kid. I was always in the Bible studies. You know, I tried to several times to read the Bible cover to cover. Very hard to do. I wouldn't recommend it. Uh, not many people do that, even Christians today. That. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but uh, so yeah, I would say that, especially amongst the youth, I had more uh, familiarity with the religion than most. Um, to the point where I actually, as a preteen, I wanted to be a preacher, and, and uh, I was supported in that by, by my family. Um, so some of the things uh, that you felt like you found in Islam that filled the void that you had, some specifics, that way we can perhaps sure. yeah, identify it, those things in our lives. A lot of it had to do with your, your daily affairs. I mean, in, we have the, the phrase we use, Sunday Christians. Right, people who just go to church on Sunday and, and go home and their faith really doesn't carry with them the rest of the week. Uh, anybody can have that relationship to their faith, whether, even if they're a Muslim. Unfortunately, we see that in our communities too. However, within Christianity, there's a lot that is kind of left unsaid or a lot that is left, uh, uh, a lot that's silent on, having to do with your daily affairs, uh, law, family law, interactions with, between, between um, certain you know, uh, people and, and work and all these sorts of things. So the, the body of literature that exists in Islam having to do with how you conduct your daily affairs, what hand you should eat with, how you should do this, how you should do that, from the most minutest details to things having to do with uh, how to conduct marriages and how to you know, conduct funerals and how to inherit and how all of these things. That was something that was new to me and something that was convincing that this seems a lot more comprehensive than, than what I'm used to. It, has, it accounts for so much more of human life and experience than what I knew. So perhaps the uh, lack of regular structure, daily structure, you're saying, was something that left you with an uneasy feeling. Where Islam provided that daily structure and that, I guess, made you feel more secure with life or more like guided or yes yes definitely so Actually. you're saying that to have structure uh for you was a good thing i of mean course. most people are saying like free choice free this don't stop me don't confine me that's what happens today with a lot of people but you're saying no i want i want rules i want structure i want left hand right hand i think that the average muslim doesn't understand what it's like to grow up without guidance or without a particular kind of guidance that is that comprehensive and how scary it can be and how 
to be in a crucial situation where you want to know what the right thing to do is, and literally you can't find out what the right thing to do is, to not know what's right and what's wrong. Whether you do the right or wrong thing eventually or not, to not know is terrifying. And it's something that I don't think the, uh, or I should say that the Muslim, they grow up with a security net in, of sorts that a lot of people, or I feel like I didn't have. That, and even if I would try to ask questions to, to preachers, to different people, I never got satisfactory responses. And there are always multiple interpretations to the point to make it meaningless. You, there, were no, there was no way of, of, of authenticating or verifying one interpretation of something over the other. And that's probably the, the second biggest thing in addition to daily structure. The ability to actually say, well, yes, this is right, and this is a religion. And no, that's not right, and that's not the religion. We see today, I mean, the Christian church and a lot of its dominations are... They're, you know, they bring rock music into the church and they've got, you know, it's, it's a party. Why? Because they just want to change anything to get anybody's attention to keep attendance up. So that's why we see the, 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 the vast, or I guess you say, ch such variance in the church communities or other religions where one is doing one program and another is doing a very different program. But when you come to the masjid, for example, you know that there's going to be a prayer, there's going to be a sermon, there's going to be a lecture, there's going to be certain fundamental things there. Right. Right, and that's, that's universal. Right. So did, what do you think about that, universality, you know, the universality of Islam, that it was... It was uh, yeah, it was, very, it was very compelling to me um, because I was always really into history and if you look into the history of a Christian church or, a Christian, or, the, or even Christendom, the Christians, they were always changing their religion to suit what people wanted to hear. Or they were always changing things in order to attract followers. And if you look at where it started and where it ended up, it's, you can't even recognize it. It's a different, different thing even, altogether. You can't even recognize it. Uh, for Islam to have such consistency in what it preaches and how, it, uh, how, it, how things are conducted, it was very compelling for me. So if you, uh, with that experience that you grew up with, would you say, um, if someone were to propose, uh, we need to reform Islam, we should rethink the structure of the masjid, we should rethink the nature of uh, the legislation uh, to better suit the needs and wants of today's world, what would be your response? I think that uh, that's a very naive approach and ill-informed. I would say that the person has to look more closely at the things that have shaped their viewpoint and the kind of assumptions that, that, that they're making implicitly when they, when they take that position. Because if you look at, if you take what is religion and what is guidance, it comes from, from, from our Creator, and it's supposed to address what? It's supposed to address human life. The technologies of human life have changed over time, yes. But the basic fundamental problems, the spiritual problems, and even the problems relating to this world, they've been the same. They've always been the same. And those problems have never changed. There hasn't come something so novel and so new that it's a particularly different spiritual struggle than something that has already been answered and provided for in the past. And some might disagree with that, but I think that... Um, Again, again. I mean, if you if you go back to history and you look at the forces that are trying to push Muslims into changing their religion, then you would kind of, I think, understand why someone is taking that position. It's much more of a product of societal pressures, expectations to assimilate, and things of that nature, than it is any uh, any lack of anything that's in the actual scripture or religion itself. Okay, so. Uh, with that, you came to a point of uh, feeling like you were ready to make this yours. You were ready to accept Islam. What was that moment? I what was the process? You know, like, I think, well, somebody said, hey, repeat after me, and boom, boom, you're done, you're a Muslim? No, it wasn't or? like that. Uh, I, so, like I said, I, try to, I, I experimented with fasting and praying, um, doing it kind of by myself. Um, I should add that I was married at the time, and we had a, a child on the way. Um, so we were, I took a semester off from college to, for the delivery of, of my son. And uh, so I was in the middle of, we were in the middle of rural Wisconsin. I was working in a restaurant, you know, 10 hour days. And it was my first Ramadan that I fasted. 
And all of a sudden, I mean, with, with Islam, if you're practicing it, people are going to know. You can't, you can't keep hiding it. Sure, so that was like a trial. So it's trial run. It's, it's, yeah, exactly. It's a trial run. I mean, I'm probably yeah. never going to see these people again. You know, I'm, okay. I'm fasting. Okay, it's like, yes, I'm fasting. No, I'm not going to eat that thing. Oh, I have to go. I have to go pray. And, you know, and it was all steps. You know, I didn't start out that way. But as I kind of tried it on myself uh, and became more resolved internally, I had to, there wasn't really any room to not own up to it in a social way. I kind of had to just fess up. And it's like, yeah, well, I'm, I, I guess I'm a Muslim. So uh, you're fasting and you're praying. Yeah. How did you feel about the prayers five times a day? Were you thinking, yeah, man, this is quite a lot? At first I thought it was a lot, but the, the more that you did it, the more that you do it, it, it becomes very easy. Okay, very, very okay. Easy. sure. Um, so you accepted Islam in Wisconsin? Yeah, it depends on your definition. I mean, I didn't take shahada until quite a long time later because I didn't realize I had to take shahada. Okay. No one told me. Sure, sure. So, okay, good. so I was fasting and praying. But you were fasting and praying. Yeah. So I mean, you were, you were, uh, you adopted the, yeah, the rituals and then the, me, I yeah. Was Muslim, but, uh, so if you, 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 you assumed that you were a Muslim there. Yeah. Right. So, so we would say in Wisconsin, you accepted Islam. Yes, we would say that. Okay. So were your parents were they up to date on these developments, or no, they were in the dark, or what? No, they were pretty in the dark. I mean, they, they knew that I was interested. They knew that I had a lot of Muslim friends. You know that uh, things like that. But it wasn't until I wanted to know what I was doing. Before I kind of tried to sell it to them, had to, had to, yeah, had to, had to represent it in that sort okay. of way. So I and and I was not living with my parents, so that was kind of easy to do. So in, until some time later, I, I eventually told my parents when I felt like I could explain myself more and explain why or what the difference was and things of that nature. Sure. And then when you told them, what was the initial reaction? Well, this was after September 11th. Oh yeah, all this is after September. So there is quite a, a different reality to accepting Islam before and after. Um, if any of us here accepted Islam, I myself before September 11th, then you know our journey into Islam when it came to family and friends, when it came to peers and coworkers and classmates, was very very different. The reaction that we that we got. So um, you know. Yeah, I'm sure that had a great deal to do with your parents' reaction. I can't, I can't complain about my parents' reaction at all. They were very understanding, given the political climate and given the, uh, given the circumstances. Um, that being said, uh, I feel like my mom had always taken responsibility in the family for our religious upbringing, and I feel like she, she took it as a personal failure in a sort of way, in a sort of way. Sure. And so it became kind of like uh, an uncomfortable thing to talk about. It was something we didn't really, I was wanting to talk about this new thing. This thing had inspired me so much, despite all these societal pressures to, to accept, wanting to kind of share, but it wasn't the right time. And um, it's actually, I was just telling someone uh, just a few minutes ago that it's only really now actually uh, this week, being with my living with my parents since I came back from Medina, just this little bit of time where I feel like they're starting to ask me questions that I was hoping that they would ask me before. Um, I think in large part because now that I'm over there studying, a lot of people are coming to them and asking them. You know, it's it's out in the open. I'm in Saudi Arabia. I'm studying this thing. It's it's very serious. So now people are coming to them. What's the difference between Sunni and Shia? What's the difference? You know, what's this? What's this about? What's that? And they kind of realized they didn't. They didn't ever ask before, so they. So now they're having to. So now they're, now they're, asking, they're having to represent as well. Now they're asking. By me. default. Exactly. Yeah, even though they don't know. Yeah. So but they have to talk about so Islam to people. But but yeah. you know, compared to other people, you know, like we, we know other converts that have had that have really really had struggles with their parents. You know, like some people disowned entirely. You know, some people. Sure. So I have, you know, no. Uh, alhamdulillah. Yeah, alhamdulillah. Yeah, that's great. So, okay, uh, after that initial kind of stage of, of converting to Islam, so you're, uh, you're still in college at this point. Mm -hmm. You're doing your degree in... One in more semester left, yeah. One more semester to go? Mm -hmm. Is that what you said? Yeah. Okay, and you're finishing up a degree in political science. Okay, and so what were you thinking was going to happen after that? I had no idea. I had absolutely no idea. Oh, like most college students yeah. then. <laughs> and in fact... Um, Accepting Islam really threw a wrench in everything because uh, here came this thing that was so compelling and so interesting that I wanted to spend my time studying it. Uh, but how to make that 
mesh or, or, or uh, how to make that merge with the directory that I was on, right? So I tried a few things. I, Let's say before, pre-Islam, what were you what were you shooting for? Uh, Pre-Islam, I was thinking maybe to just keep on going into. I was I did international relations. I was thinking more just academia, uh, professorships, things like that. Teaching. Okay. Yeah. But um, now you shifted from political science to more religious type of. Yeah, I really wanted to engage the religion in a really serious way. It, you know, some people they they accept Islam and it's enough for them to just. Kind of, kind of just be, just be, yeah. Go through the salat, basics. That's it, you know. Mashallah, yeah. and that's you know, that's, that's fine. But for me, it was that was never enough. I, I had to, I had to get to the bottom of things. I wanted to know things. I wanted to okay. to study it seriously. Like, what was the driving force that pushed you to to try and learn more, to get to the bottom of things, as you say, or to learn about you know the details of the faith? I mean, what was it? I mean, why wasn't it enough just to say, all right, I'm Muslim. Uh, I, I learn how to pray. Alhamdulillah, I make the, 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 I do the obligations. Why did you feel that wasn't sufficient? That wasn't satisfactory to you? That's a very good question. Uh, because I mean, it was there. It's there to be had. Like I, okay. it kind of comes back to earlier, where you don't know what that feeling is like unless you didn't have it before, and now you have it. So I wanted to go all the way with it. I wanted sure. to see. You know, there's there's things to know that I never thought I'd be able to figure out before. I never thought I'd be able to get a clear answer on. But now you've seen that there are answers yes, to those, answer those questions answers, you have. Yes, so get those answers. Right. And the answers there in Islam. Exactly, yes. So you, you, you're going to dedicate yourself oh, now to, to, to pursuit of knowledge. I had to somehow. Yeah. I'll find a way. So the American university system, that was an option. You started to look around to see, is there a program? I started to look into several different programs. I started to look into religious studies programs. I looked into Middle Eastern studies departments, um, both PhD and master's programs, and I applied to several. Um, and it just didn't work out in the just unfolding of things. And it also, I became less and less convinced as I went along that that was where I could engage the religion in the way I wanted to. Um, Why is that? Well, without throwing someone under the bus, I, I met, so for example, I had the opportunity to meet someone who was, let's say he was, the, he was one of the top people in Middle Eastern studies departments in the, in the country. Okay. Uh, and I was looking into his program, to study into his program. And he came to our school, and he, gave, and he gave a talk. And usually how these things work, you know, they give a lecture, and then there's like the small cohort of students that goes out to dinner, with the, with the speaker, takes him out to dinner afterwards. And, Familiar with that? Yeah. And yeah, it's kind of you know that whole like, yeah. chummy kind of scene. And but, but what I saw from him just made me just didn't sit with me right. Okay. He 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 ordered wine. He was drinking wine at the table. And this is someone who writes a lot about uh, about Islam. Uh, and just the way the very kind of the meal was very opulent and a lot was wasted and. That was, it just didn't sit right with me. I said, is this the kind of person that I want to study under? Okay. Is this the kind of person that I want to become? Uh, the answer was definitely not, no way. So you wanted somebody that walked the walk, you know, yeah, they walked exactly. the walk and you know, they were, it wasn't just an academic pursuit, but it was a lifestyle. Exactly, there's that aspect. And then from- What, what about I, from the Western study of Islam? Yeah, that was the other thing, is that I, I came to realize all the programs I checked out, that nothing that I found uh, engaged Islam from the inside. All of it was looking at Islam from the outside. And you may say, okay, well, there's maybe some benefit to looking at Islam from the outside, and maybe there is, but I would say that the, the core foundations of how religion is understood in religious studies departments, in Middle Eastern studies departments, in, in in most programs that I, I came in contact with and I talked to the, the advisors of and I emailed and I looked into the classes and the syllabi and everything, at the base of it they're atheistic. At the, ba at the base of it is, is, is an atheistic worldview. They look at religion as something that humans invented. Okay. That's, that's the base. They look, at, they look at religion through the eyes that humans, human beings invented it. Mm. And they study everything more or less through that prism. So I had a choice to make you know, if I wanted to to study Islam in a way where I was going to be, I felt doing justice to what it was saying, which sure. was that this is this is the truth. So you wouldn't have enjoyed being in a in a class, let's say a master's degree program on Islamic studies or the Middle East, 
and then having your professor, for example, assign you a paper uh, to defend the position that God doesn't exist. I mean, I feel like uh, I feel like that Allah saved me from that because <clears throat> yeah, I feel like I feel like Allah saved me from that because you you face a lot of there's a ceiling, right? Okay. For 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 most people in these sorts of things. Like there, and there's a culture to it, just like the one, the one professor. He was, you know, with his wine, his his opulent meal and stuff like that. That's the kind of culture that there is to it. And if you don't fit in with that culture, you know, you might not get the grants. Sure. You might not, or you might not, might not get the promotion, right, in the job world. Like we see, we know that. We're, you know, we we experience that. Not be, not, might not be on the track for. Yeah, there's a ceiling. So yeah. it, it, I didn't see it at the time, but now that I look at it, it would have presented a kind of an existential crisis at some point. Sure. Because the track I was on, I was only wanting to get more serious in studying the religion, and as my my practice developed as well, there were less and less things that I was willing to compromise on when it came to that practice. Okay. So that would have entailed a conflict if I had gotten into a master's or a PhD program, you know, of, of, if that's the kind of spirit that, that Islam was studied in. So then you got Medina as the next option, or as the next step here. Well, it didn't come along until a while. I, I just went to the workforce. I worked, I worked in restaurants. I worked on farms for four years and just okay. trying to figure out things. Sure, trying to just floating and just thinking, what am I going to do? Yeah, what am I going to do? Yeah. How am I going to pull this together? And then, and then, um, but that was good. That was a good time for you, though, time. to figure out the direction. It was a very good time. I, I learned a lot. I learned a lot about the religion. I studied things as much as I could on my own. Waded through Jews Anma by myself and made a lot of mistakes memorizing. But okay. I just got done correcting in Medina. Sure. Um, and, uh, yeah, yeah, it grew a lot under who I, could, who I was able to be around. Um, and then it was suggested to me by none other than yourself to to think about to consider studying Medina. And uh, when I told my wife that, she said, "You're crazy." You're crazy. And then, yeah. she, then she said, "I think it's a good idea." So we so we went for it. And humbly, well, made it made it easy. So you got accepted. So, uh, what's the application process like? The application is, is not... For those that might be interested or know someone interested? It's not like college here at all. I mean, it basically, it, they don't even care if you've gone to college. They want your high school transcript, and they want letters of recommendation, two letters of recommendation, preferably from somebody who studied at a well-known university, uh, who has some, some clout, or who, who is associated with an institution, an Islamic institution. After that, it's all mundane things, passport, you know, birth certificate. Okay, like so that. they don't have like a... Uh, no essay, no describe yourself, no CV. No? No, uh, no, there's no... Why, I, why I want to join, no, nothing no, like no, that. There's no, there's no sell yourself to us. Is there, like a, is there like a method to that madness of enrolling students from around the world? I think so, I mean, I think so. I think that they prioritize, and you know better than me, and other people know better than me as well, but I think that they prioritize recommendation which is very wise. How can you trust someone to talk about themselves? You want to get into the program? I mean, I've done it. We've all done it on job applications or interviews. We've done My a little... whole life is leading up to this job. I'm going to be working behind the counter, you know, cashing it, you know, working at cash okay, register, okay. but my whole life's been leading, you know? That's okay, what yeah. you're kind of led to do by the, the sell yourself method of, uh, of applying or something. So you yeah. got accepted then, and? Yeah. And how, much, how much are you paying in tuition right now? Nothing, they pay for everything. Okay, so they're paying for everything. So, from what you've seen uh, of Medina University in comparison to uh, the universities that we have here, what would you put as a tuition dollar amount? The school I went to? I mean, looking at Medina University, oh. what do you think they would charge for tuition if they were here? With the program they offer, the services, all of that? Uh, it's really, it's, it's priceless. You can't, you can't put a dollar value on what they give you the opportunity to do. But if we were to say, what do you think? <laughs> uh, uh, we understand prices because the knowledge that you're learning there is not, it's not sold, it's not bought, but it's, you know, it's something that's divine. But to go through the program, to be enrolled in college, you're doing a, an associate's degree, you're going to do a, a bachelor's degree, inshallah, you're, you're living on campus, you're, you know, you're going through a course or a, a, a course, a program of study that's um, in my experience, more demanding in terms of the curriculum and the sheer amount of 
hours studied than most universities over here. But still you find universities, depending on the, what I'm trying to get at is to gauge the level of the college. Is this like a community college? Is this like a state school? Is this like an Ivy League? This is Ivy League, no doubt. Okay. If you look at their acceptance rates, they have acceptance rates that mimic those of Ivy League colleges, 10%, 15%. 10% get accepted? Get accepted, yeah. Okay, so on average, how many students from America go a year? Go, get accepted, maybe 30 or 40 students get accepted. Okay. Who knows how many applications. However many. However, when you go, uh, probably probably half of that, probably 20, between 20 or 30 okay. students go each year. So it's a very small pool. And small very, pool very of 50 few, states. Yeah, and very few of those yeah. will make it, as you know. Sure, very yeah. Very few of those will complete the program. Historically speaking, the, uh, the Western students of Medina, uh, the, the graduation rate has been very low. So if you've got a batch of 15 or 20 that come in, you might have uh, five or six that will actually complete the program. But I think that's like a lot of colleges, right? I mean, there's like a dropout rate yeah, there. That's true. Yeah, not everybody was built for that formal study in a university. No, that's true. So it's not like anyone and everyone could do it. No, not at all. Not but at it's... All. It's the real deal. No, it's, it's, not, it's not an easy... Uh, it's not a rubber stamp. You, if you get a degree from Medina, you earn it, definitely. Uh, that being said, there's a lot of variance, uh, variation as to what you can... You can if you take... What I mean to say is that they have a lot of extracurricular opportunities for you to study as well. Okay. So the ceiling is quite high for what you're able to take away from your time in Medina. So it's up to you to avail yourself of, of everything. Sure. Um, so what are you doing right now? What are you studying? So right now I'm in the I'm in the Mahat, I'm in the Institute of Arabic Language. I just uh, passed the second level. There's four levels. Um, so how'd you do? I did well. I'm with them. Well. Yeah, I'm with them. Like, uh, well, well, or just well? Well, well. <laughs> well, alhamdulillah. I haven't seen my grades yet, but I, I knew my grades up until the You finals. felt confident. Yeah, well, well, How were the tests? How was that? Like, a uh, little bit of like insight as to uh, what you remember test taking was like here in school versus what it's like over there. I mean, it's, do they rely on understanding? Do they rely on comprehension, memorization? It's much more focused on memorization than here. Was that a big difference? Yeah, it's a big difference, especially for people who grew up in the West with a Western style of education. I mean, we're not necessarily used to, if we can repeat it or repeat something in our own words, or rep, um, rehash something in our own words, that's usually good enough to pass. But okay. if you don't have every letter in the place, then... You're not required to actually memorize the text exactly. verbatim. Yeah, and you are required to memorize the text there. Okay. Um, How'd you find it? Uh, yeah, like you said, it takes more hours. Sure. It takes more practice for someone like me who hasn't had that kind of education growing up. It takes getting used to. So in the Arabic program, how many hours a day outside of class do you think you spend studying? I mean, I study all day. Basically, that's what I do. Okay. Uh, so it's beyond a full-time job. Oh, yeah. Not everybody does that, but that's what I do. I also have things that I'm studying outside of the normal classes. Because I was going to ask you that. Yeah. So I've, um, I've been recommended by everybody, that all the, the older students, that you have to prepare yourself for, for the, the bachelor's program because there's quite a step up between the Institute of Arabic Language and the, and the Bachelor's Program. Sure. So there's several texts that people recommend uh, in different Islamic fields to get, to get uh, familiarized with them before you get to, uh, before you get to the, the BA program. Um, so this semester, I completed with some other students, Ajah uh, which is a text in, in Arabic grammar. I completed Waraqat, uh, which is a, a basic text, a text in Usul Fiqh. And um, let's see, there's one more. The other one's slipping my mind at this moment. But I did, I did three texts outside of, um, outside of the, the normal study. So these are like primers into much more vast topics. Yes, they are. And they're primers because they're, they're extremely condensed and they're expected to be memorized. So, okay. So if you're able to memorize them, uh, you'll have a leg up when you get to the, 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 the bachelor's program. Sure. Uh, you'll have sign up, kind of a, a road map for, for the basics. So looking forward from the Arabic program, you said you're in semester number two or level two. Mm -hmm. You got level three. That's a step up, by the way, from my experience in level four. So you're going to do three semesters in the Arabic program, inshallah. What's the next step? You're going to go to college. What, what's offered there? I mean, what kind of programs do they have? So the programs, they have different, they have different colleges. They have College of Qur'an, which you have to already be a Hafiz to enter. Okay. Uh, you have, they have the, the College of Hadith, the College of Da'wah, Usul al-Din. Da'wah, Usul al-Din is? is a calling to Islam and the foundations of the religion, the principles of the religion. Okay, great. And then the, 
the faculty of Sharia, Islamic law. Islamic law. And then language, Arabic language. Okay, Arabic language has an Arabic has its own college. Yes. So you're going to pick, uh, or your heart's kind of directed towards which one? Uh, I'm thinking Sharia. Uh, a lot of my teachers. You sure? Uh, no, I'm not sure. You're coming back to America. You know, they're worried worried about creeping <laughs> Sharia. I don't know. <laughs> Well, that's the thing is that it's so poorly understood and it's so desperately needed. And if you just take the fact that what is, I mean, that you can tell us better than anybody else, well, most of the questions that you field, you know, probably have to do with fit, probably have to do with Sharia. So they have to do with like the how to and yeah. the, the and like, how what do, do I do? Lives. Step one, step two. Exactly. Is this halal? Is this haram? Exactly. Okay. So that's I'm probably the most useful. Sure. So you said to me before, um, uh, one of your professors told you people want to know, um, what to believe. Yes, Aqidah and Fiqh. They want to know what to believe and, and how, how to how to practice. How to practice. Right? So these are two very, very important topics. So you're gonna uh, hopefully at this point be looking to help people along the how to. Not that you will not cover topics of doctrine, theology and things like that, because it's all in there. It is. And in, you're in expected program. to round yourself out with study outside of your your, uh, your program study at the university with classes at the at Masjid al -Nabawi. Great, this is where I was coming next was um, life in Medina. We're not gonna get to the, uh, the friendly social part. I'm gonna we'll come back to that because I'm sure people wanna know about that as well. But outside of the university in Medina, how many opportunities do you have to uh, learn from a qualified imam or scholar um, outside of the college? More than you could ever, 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 ever take advantage of. It's, it's astounding, it's astounding how many opportunities there are to learn and how easy it is. Um, for all ages, for all walks of life, for everything, it's really, really amazing to be in Masjid Nawi. I go, uh, go every, every day for Fajr and I study the Quran there after Fajr every day. Okay. And the... Is it, is it like... Uh, so let me just... I want to frame this for everyone sitting here. So you're saying that the opportunity is, is abundant. Yes. So could you attend all of the lectures that are offered in one day? There's no way. There's no Not chance. possible. There's no chance. There's, over, there's probably over 100. Okay. And do you think that they're going probably at the same time? Yeah. From what I remember, in Meshit Nebuwi, there would be, uh, the Meshit is so vast that there would be chairs every couple of blocks, if you will, where a teacher, a sheikh, who dedicated his life to Islam would study and then be his neighbor teaching at the same time and his neighbor teaching at the same time. So we have so many opportunities to learn. And with that amount of opportunity, the attendance must have been very low. Let me say this. If this chair is the chair of Sheikh Abdul Muslim and Badr, okay. and the, the extent that his students flock around him every night, and these are like weekend, weekend nights and weekday nights, fills up this entire space and people are sitting on top of each other. Okay, so... Uh, it's not like a, hey, he's there. Uh, there's other classes. Standing room only. Standing room. So you're saying like, Sheikh, this Sheikh, are you talking about Abdul Muhsin yeah. Al-Badr? Yeah, yeah. He's one of the major scholars of Al-Madina. He's considered Muhaddith Al-Madina. Yeah. The scholar of Hadith, the senior scholar of Hadith of Medina. And like you said, so he, this is his chair. So you think that the amount of students that are with him day in and day out, Monday through Friday, and weekends. Saturday night, yep. There, oh, he's, on, he's on Saturday. He's Saturday too. Yeah. Okay. They would fill up the entire room? Easy. Easy. No chairs, no desks, no. crouched in, Easy. tucked in, got your book on your lap, That's cramping right. on the side. Yeah, easy. What do you do when you can start cramping up? What do you got to do? What can you do? Make, make the Jabba Jacks or what? Ask a lot. Make do Okay. Okay, so you think that um, with that attendance like that, there has to be some sacrifice made somewhere, right? Yeah, you have, to, you have to. I mean, there has to be some sacrifices for the attendees, the students that are there. I mean, what do you think they're sacrificing? Are they missing out on, you know, there's a lot of things to do in Medina. I mean, primarily missing out on the other lessons they're not going to. They're missing out on the other lessons. So they're not, what about the shops? And the, and the, and the, yeah, I mean, there's malls, there's shops, there's things, but... That, so that stuff's there? That stuff's there, yeah. Parks and games oh, and yeah, rides yeah, and stuff. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's not like that's the only thing they have. Right, right. So what, what I want to say is, that they're choosing yes. this over something else? Yes, definitely. It's there, and if you drive down Sultana Road on Friday night, you will see Burger King is packed, but much more packed is Messi and Emily Friday, Saturday, Burger Sunday King, night. Huh? Yeah, yeah, that's the cool place. What, um, what, McDon McDonald's not cool anymore? Uh, it's a lot out of the way. Oh, okay. <laughs> McDonald's. That, that, that oh, that's the, 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 the... Sultana, the, you know what I'm talking about. Yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah. 
But which Burger King are you talking about? The one uh, by Wall Street, Wall Street English. Oh, the one it's right next to since you've been there. No, I was, I, I know Wall Street very well. Okay, it's right there. I taught at Wall Street for a little while. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And the Burger King you're talking about next to the, the, the bookstore. Yeah. Right? Yeah. This is the bookstore still there, right? Yeah, it's still there. Okay, good. Jariya. Yeah, but yeah, as, as much as, yeah, of course people are doing those things, but by far uh, the, the place to be is, yeah, it's in Moshe Kappa Muslim on Friday and Saturday night. Okay, so that's the go-to spot. Are there any other uh, scholars that you sat with so far, attended their lessons? I've pretty much, upon the recommendation of my predecessors, have stuck to more basic things. Okay. Um, Partly because of my level of Arabic, I'm still getting the hang of it. Um, so do you think that if there was a student that just arrived, their level of Arabic was uh, limited, uh, they're, they're still kind of building their skill, uh, that they should stick more to mastering that study as opposed to um, jumping around to all the various lessons there's and no attending doubt. everything? No, there's no doubt. In fact, all the older students, they regret and they lament to me. They say that my biggest regret was that I didn't focus on the Quran and the Luga and the, and the Arabic language when I was in the Ma'at. Okay. That I went around to this shape and that shape and that shape. Sure. And yeah, it was fun. And yeah, it was nice. And yeah, I did. It was glamorous. It was glamorous, yeah. Got and to I, see everybody's yeah, face yeah, and take. Right. Well, we weren't taking selfies friends. or anything with them. <laughs> That'd be uh, breaking protocol. Yeah. Um, but uh, <laughs> yeah. But yeah, they all regret it. And they but say, so basically, you have experienced and have been told by your uh, the upperclassmen there that uh, to to become grounded and to to develop in Islam is to is to take a course and go through its entirety. That's right. As opposed to like one here, one there, a weekend here, a weekend there, yeah, like a yearly house. seminar, yearly workshop. No, it's like a house. You have to build it and you have to build it from the bottom up. Okay, you so you think building it that way is regular yes. opportunities, That's taking right. advantage of regular long term. Yes. Yeah. Okay. That's good. So to answer your question, the only uh, halakha that I joined in the Haram was the Quran, the Tafi, the memorization of the Quran every morning after Fajr. Okay, nice. Um, so, yeah, that was wonderful. The students there were great. The, the sheikh was great. Mm. Two hours every morning at least. Two hours every morning. Yeah. So, um, now that we've talked a little bit about the, the rigor, I, I, can, I, I remember and I can tell from your experience that the study is rigorous. It, it demands a lot. Um, how about uh, mentioning the most memorable moment you've had so far? It was pretty. It was pretty impressive the first time I saw uh, the first time I saw Sheikh Abdul Mufsin in his study circle. That was very, very impressive. That just the just the volume. Just, just the, the volume. The attendance. It, it goes on and on. I don't even think I really in, in, uh, encompassed with my mind how many students are, are sitting. Well, you you weren't expecting that, or I just didn't. Uh, I never seen that before. Yeah. Never seen that attendance before. Yeah, not like that for that sort of thing. Okay. You know. I mean, you've never gone to like the big conferences that we have here, the annual. Uh, retreats that we have here where we get those numbers we get even more numbers well, than it's that it's different it's different because people I don't know I don't know how but it just seems different to me I don't know okay maybe because it's a regular occurrence yeah maybe it's regular occurrence maybe it's because of the sacrifice that I know that the people have to make I mean a lot of the people that study in the harm they're from all over the world and they've sacrificed a lot to be there sure um, so. so what's your typical day like you so get up you typical go day is I wake up before Fajr I start walking I go to the go to the harm for Fajr prayer and then I study Quran for between two and three hours. Tell us about your commute from your dorm to the. Uh, yes. I want, there's a story I'm after. You know what it is. Yeah, yeah. So every morning, so I didn't have a way. I live off campus, um, but in the in a dormitory off campus, and I was trying to get some of the other brothers to to go in with me to to come uh, to the haram every morning to start with the halakha because I needed it because I I didn't grow up being a Muslim. I'm very weak in the Quran. It's one of my goals to memorize the whole Quran while I'm there. So I have to, I have to work harder than most people, and I need to get catch up. Yeah. So it take was, advantage of the morning hours. Exactly, it was a big priority for me. So uh, I tried to get other people to go. Everyone's like, ah, uh, too early. Uh, why do you want other people far. to go with you? Hmm? Why, why do you want? I mean, why don't you just take it for yourself? Well, it's that's the nice thing about the the, the culture of the students there is that if you fall in with the right students, there's a very cooperative uh, vibe going. Helping each other exactly. out, encouraging fact, each other. I've got a, a nucleus of students that we say, What's, if you find a teacher, we're in. And we follow, if someone finds something, then we all we all attend that circle. Okay. Um, at least was, we let each other know about it. Was there a secondary reason you needed other people? Uh, like taxi fare? Or? Taxi fare, yeah. Taxi fare, I need some gas money. Yeah, yeah, I'm figuring, you know, usually the, how the taxis work there is that they, they bump the, the charges less per person. 
if you get more people. Okay. So I'm thinking Great. that. So anyway, I just start walking. So you're gonna walk. How long is the walk from your dorm? It's an hour walk to the hospital. Hour walk hour from walk. your dorm to the masjid. But you're going. So you're up before Fajr by an hour at oh, least yeah. Oh, yeah. to make it by prayer time. Then you're gonna stay another two hours. Yeah. So you're going. Yeah. And you're gonna go get a taxi. Well, I was just gonna walk actually. Oh, you're gonna walk because okay. no one else would go with one. In a taxi. So you can, you're gonna save money. money. Exactly. Like. Um, so you mean you're not just taking taxis all the time? I mean, no, you're not spending no, money. I can't afford that. You can't afford that. No, I can't afford that. Okay. So, um, so yeah, I was just going to walk and then every single morning when I, from, from when I started throughout the semester, uh, someone would just stop on the side of the road and drive me there for free. Drive you for free? Yeah. Just okay. For the, just for the... Have you found that to be the general kind of attitude? Oh, yeah. Or is that specific, particular to Fedger time? No, no, no. Fedger time is a special time. It is a special time. I noticed that in Medina as well. <laughs> it's a special time. It is true. In Medina. Yeah. And so you'll find this type of occurrence more frequently than, let's say, in the business hours. Yeah, it depends. But I mean, I've I've had I've had people cancel fares. You know, like if they start talking to you, they realize they how find far they you find out you're Amriki. Yeah, well, Amriki, well, Amriki. Aslan, Aslan. So they say, okay, خلاص. Yeah, all the time. So we don't need money. All the time. There's people, wow. that, been, people that gave me money for books. So wow. Take this for books. Okay, that's generous. Yeah, mashallah. That's generous. Yeah, it's, it's amazing the kind of generosity. Have you experienced that generosity here? Uh, yeah, yes, yeah. I have. But not... not are they, are, is it the same? Or no, it's, it's, it's much more over there. I mean, there's... So yeah. You can tell the difference. Yeah, I mean, people... And there's exceptions, you know, but... but People are really, really trying to go out of the way to do good. Okay, would you say and that... the students. They really, really care yeah. about the students there. The so students are like the identity of Medina. Medina is kind of a university town. It's kind of a university yeah. town. Yeah, yeah. And they it's love got, the students. Yeah, and it creates that kind of vibe. Yeah. So, um, what I wanted to ask you was, uh, this would be more for somebody that was looking to go and to live there, even not as a student, but someone else. When you go to Medina, did you find Sahaba there? No. No, no, I did not. You didn't? No, I didn't. Come on, we see the pictures, the posters of Medina, the masjid. It's so beautiful, it's so clean, and, and I, I would imagine that everyone is just as pious as could be. It's like Sahaba, it's like Tabi'een, it's like... You need to be very patient. You have to be patient, okay. You have to be very patient. You have to be patient. Yeah. So it's, but, not, a, it's not a perfect, it's it's not a perfect it's not place? Perfect, no, and in fact, you and my other advisors and teachers and people who have been there did the best thing that they could for me by almost playing up more than is real. Playing up the difficulties. The difficulties, yeah, Okay, exactly. the realities. So I wasn't, yeah, I wasn't uh, a deer in headlights when I got there. You weren't disappointed with uh, finding no, someone that's... In fact, I was, I was pleased by how much uh, good behavior and, and good qualities and generosity that I found. So I was expecting... Alhamdulillah, that's good, that's good. So you've been in Medina, that's your school, that's your home, your dorm's there, your book's there, studies there. Have you been able to travel yet around? I went twice for Umrah to Mecca. Twice, okay, good. On the yeah, the, the Jamia that they do is uh, the the university they put a, a list up out outside the classrooms every week, and if you're on the list, you go to Umrah for free. Oh, for free, they take you as well. They take you. Wow, so you get meals. tuition, you get a dorm, you get. Uh, they send you to your homeland once every year. They send you to your homeland every year. Yep, uh, Return ticket to yep, and to and from. To and from. Then they, they give you free Umrah trips. And they give you a stipend. And they give you a stipend. So then you get some money. That's right. Right, is it, you're rolling in it, I guess. Then, uh, right? It's not, it's, it's, it's Come enough. on, it's petrol dollars. Let's go. It's oil money. You probably give you probably richer than we are. I'm my you can donate to the master here and help support. It's, um, you can become platinum member here. We have a membership card ready. <laughs> it's enough to it's enough to get by for an individual. For an individual, yeah. it's enough to get by. Yeah. yeah. Like, what would you say if you feel comfortable? It's if a, you don't feel, I'll say because how, I remember. For how much they pay? Yeah, in a dollar, in a dollar yeah, amount. Yeah, they pay you like two hundred dollars a month. Two hundred bucks a month. Yeah, which basically covers your your meals and books. Okay, so that transfer isn't enough to to get by and to buy books and yeah. supplies and clothes and food and stuff. Yeah. Yeah. What about the cafeteria there? How's the food been? That's great. Great, huh? Yeah. What are you eating? Like uh, camel burgers or? No, <laughs> it's mostly uh, well, it's <laughs> it's mostly rice and, uh, and chicken. I mean, all the guys who work in the in the cafeteria, they're all Bengali guys. So oh, so you're food. getting dal, mung dal, and stuff yeah, like yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah, Medina is quite diverse. It's amazing. I mean, there's a lot of people from different places. Okay. Yeah. Very strong Bengali and Pakistani communities there. Okay, a lot of Bengali, a lot of Pakistani. That's good because we're, we're we love the Desi here, oh, Desi don't crowd worry, here. Yeah. Get you. Yeah. You get yeah. You try. Yeah. I've been adopted, by the way, into the uh, the fold of the Desi culture. Yeah. So, 
Uh, how international is it on the campus? I mean, I remember there being a lot of students from all over the world. It's staggering. I mean, I went to a liberal arts college and where they really, really try to get diversity, but the kind of diversity that exists at the University of Medina it just puts to shame any university here. So how many, co how many countries or how many, uh, I don't know, the representation there, what do you There's think? over 190 countries represented. 190? Yes, 190, over. Over 190 countries, countries represented, represented. The students there. In my, okay. in my class of over 30 people, there were only two or three pairs of students that were from the same country. Oh, okay. Wow, that's nice. Yeah. That's Virtually a good experience. every single person is from a different country. So, I would imagine the experience is just as enriching as the study would be. It is, it's true. Not that it isn't, you don't, not that you don't ever have to have patience and you don't ever find something, uh, you know, that, um, that you won't like, but the the kinds of people that are at the University of Vienna are remarkable people. From having gra gone to college here and graduated college here and have going to the University of Medina and seeing the kinds of people, there's a lot of remarkable, remarkable individuals there. Coming from a Vassar College graduate, you're not a slouch yourself when it comes to school, right? But you're saying you've seen some amazing people over there as well. There are people there who Because I'm thinking that as an American you should you should be top, you should be number one, because we're number one. <laughs> There are people there who enter into the Mahat, they've already memorized the entire Quran with all recitations, so they've already memorized books of Hadith, entire books of Hadith. Okay, and they're in the and Mahat, the Arabic program. Old. 17. Memorize Quran, memorize books of Hadith. Bukhari, Muslim. Bukhari, Muslim. All the Qiraat. Okay, Quran. all the recitations. Yeah. And they're in the Arabic program with you. Yeah. So how are you feeling? You're like, <laughs> don't call on me, like teacher. <laughs> yeah. Like yeah. Wow. Yeah. Wow, okay. That's why I said, I feel like I have like, almost a tip on my shoulder, I have a lot of catching up to do. Yeah. Five years ago, I never even looked at these letters, right? Sure. And now, and now you're trying to navigate through a whole language, yeah. a whole study. Yeah. May Allah bless you and increase you in your, in your knowledge and guide you through your journey here. Yeah. Um, how about, uh, you, you said you made Umrah twice uh, on, the, on the fully paid expense from the university, which of course is, uh, is that a private uh, institution or is that a government funded uh, university? Uh, it's all government funded. Okay, so this is coming from the government. The, the amount so of you think the petrol dollars are going into uh, kind of teaching Islam? I don't and know of any country that works harder for Islam or for education. Oh. It's amazing the kinds of invest, the, the kind of investment, and the extent to which uh, they they prioritize education and they love the students. King Salman, when he was when he became king, he he gave a bonus to all the students first thing. First wow. Thing he did. Okay. Uh, and he's very, the students love him, he loves the students. He, uh, it's just, yeah, the, the country very, very highly prioritizes education. And, uh, it's, it's they highly prioritize education. What about religious studies? Because in some cultures, the religious studies and to pursue Islamic knowledge or a position as a religious leader is like the last thing. They're like, okay, you didn't get into engineering, you didn't get into the army, you didn't get into the police force, so you can become an imam. Yeah, I mean, I'll be honest. Is I, that I the case? Just, I, I'll be honest. It's not as highly that isn't high, high, as high as highly prioritized as it should be. Um, like if you if you take your exams like in Saudi, if you, like if you get the highest grades, you go to become a doctor. Okay. And if you get the next highest, then it's doctor uh, still got us. Yeah, then we it's got a couple of them with engineer, us today. Engineer, and then engineer. it's like below that, and it's like okay, we'll go to Kuwait uh, to Sharia or something. Like and then you go in to become go. The, the the College of Sharia. Yes, but that being said, uh, for the amount, uh, there's that. But then there's also the opportunity to give to people who are coming abroad, and that is just, you can't find that anywhere else. It's, it, it's incredible. And the, the ability that people have, I mean, look at Shaykh Ibn Rafaymin. Okay, the, the son Rafaymin, of a, rahimahullah. Rahimahullah, who's the son of a, of a farmer. Oh, wow, yeah. I'm, I'm sure you know that these stories. He didn't have any money to, to enroll in any classes. Sure. But, People are willing to pay and invest in that person, and that person who came from nothing is one of the, the best scholars of our of, of the last hundred years. Sure. So there's that. Even if uh, some of the people who don't uh, get funneled into you know uh, religious right. studies aren't, uh, if it, if it doesn't even really get prioritized that much on that end, that sort of thing goes on a lot, where people are very very ready to support education and and then prioritize it. So there's another thing that I wanted to point out with this, uh, the, the prioritization of education as well as religious studies, because uh, in Medina and in the country in general, it's the students of Sharia 
the, uh, the best of the class, of course, that go on perhaps to further studies, but the College of Sharia, they produce the country's judges. So they go and sit as a judge somewhere. So it's not like what we would think here where the religious student or the religious graduate, he goes off and he becomes an imam and that's all, that, that's, all that's available to him. But he becomes a judge, he becomes a, a part of the legal uh, structure because that's the basis of the law there. So they go and they take these positions in the courthouse. And I remember when I was there that the imam of the haram, Sheikh Hudayfi, he worked across the street in the courthouse. And you would see him coming from his, uh, his salah break for the Lord, walking from his job in the courthouse. And many of the scholars in Medina, they worked also in the courthouse in some, some, uh, in some uh, capacity. Right? So there's a lot of opportunity there. And I was told by one of my uh, teachers that uh, they only give those positions to the graduates of Sharia. Right, so I think your choice so far <laughs> has, been, has been on point here. All right, let's move on after that. Uh, so we were talking about Umrah. This is where I wanted to get at. Uh, if you've ever, uh, many of us uh, have, or some of us have made the journey over to Mecca. We've made pilgrimage. We've made Umrah. We've traveled. If not, we grew up with the picture of the Kaaba hanging in the house somewhere. We see it on the internet, on Facebook. Uh, it should be regularly, re a regular normal. What was your experience the first time you saw it? <laughs> well, I was just telling you a little bit ago that, unfortunately, the people I was with kind of ruined it for me. Um, okay. Because there's this thing, okay, and I'm going to advise you all to not do this to, to new Muslims, right? Uh, where you know that there's, a, there's a, a new Muslim, right, and he's about to go through an experience, and... You keep on telling that person how amazing it's going to be, how awesome it's going to be. You're gonna, it's going to be the best. I want to be there for it. I'm going to take a picture while you, while you go see it. I'm going to hold your hand the whole time. Right. And, uh, We're going to post it. a selfie on the... Yeah, exactly. Yeah. It kills it. Update and the so status. So that was kind of the first time I went on Umrah. It was, uh, you know, it's... Uh, I didn't... I wasn't able to uh, experience it very personally. I kind of felt that kind of... Uh, you mean you didn't like just... You weren't over overwhelmed with... I, when, the I, when I finally got to myself and I was making tawaf, yes, I was very overwhelmed. Okay. Um, especially, you know, having, you know, when you read the seer and you read the, the things that the Prophet saw him had to, to put up with and there and what he experienced there, then, yeah, then it's, it's, it's very overwhelming. So uh, we're going to wrap up here. We're getting close to the prayer time. Uh, there's a couple of things here uh, that I want to get your, your, your feedback based on what you've experienced and witnessed, what you've been a part of uh, so far in Medina. And that has to do with our situation here. So I give you a couple of questions. First thing that comes to your mind, uh, one or two, three lines, whatever you think will do justice to it. Islam in the KSA versus Islam in the USA. Strong there, weak here. Okay, strong there, weak here. Youth, growing up, in Medina, youth growing up in South Jersey. Yeah, stronger there. Stronger there. Uh, let's just say, I heard all the stories, you know, I heard people were telling me, oh, the youth in Saudi Arabia, they're running away from their religion. I heard people would try to tell me these sorts of things. Not my experience. Not my experience okay. at all. Uh, in fact, when I tell them that in places like in the West, there are people who, who call themselves Muslims, but they don't pray, they're astonished. They're astonished. Over there. Over there. So you say, they say they're Muslim, but they don't pray. Yeah, if I say that, they say, how they always say, how's, how's Islam in the West? How's Islam okay. in America? And I say, well, you know, it's okay. You know, we've got, we're doing what we can. But there's some people that, you know, they don't pray or they, they've abandoned the prayer. They've abandoned this and they're, they're shocked. Okay. They're shocked. Do you think that um, it has to be like that? Strong over there, weak over here? No, of course Good not. Good youth over there, weaker here in terms no. of religious development? No, of course not. Is it just because, well, we're in America. We, we, can't, we can't do anything about it. That's no. just our reality. No, no, no. It has to do with our attitude. It has to do with the responsibility that we take. This is something I try to get across to, to people, you know, people who grew up in a Muslim family, grew up with Muslim parents, you don't realize the benefit that you've had and the, the thing that Allah has given you. For someone, uh, for someone to not have it and then to come to it, you really see uh, what a difference it makes. And if you take into consideration the fact that Allah is going to, to ask you about how you, you how you took advantage and what you did with everything you were entrusted with, even your, even your eyesight, 
even your, your senses. What do you do with those things? A your lot. free time. Your free time. Sure. So choices have to be made. So then you were given Islam. Okay. Other people weren't given Islam. I wasn't given Islam. Sure. I was given to it eventually, but not right. from the get-go. So you've, so you've been able to experience what it's like without, and exactly. therefore you, you appreciate what it's like with. Do you think a person that grew up as a Muslim, they could share the same appreciation that you've of developed course, for Islam? Of course. They, just, they can't take it for granted. They have to realize that they've been given such a big benefit and such a head start. You know, every time I'm sitting two hours in Masjid al Nabawi trying to struggle to read the Quran, some people have been reading that script their entire lives and can read it. They can memorize the Quran like this if they wanted to. Mm. Yet I'm there, busting my hump, trying to trying to get it done. Okay. That person doesn't have an excuse. That person's got a. That person has has more of a reason to accept. So they have to name. find something within Islam that that uh, triggers uh, their their passion, I guess, if you will, or their or their commitment. Yeah. So you were able to, in your journey to accepting Islam and then eventually making your way over to Medina, you were able to find something that resonated with you, that was, uh, that embraced you, if you will, right? So you're saying that it's possible for someone who grew up as a Muslim, even here in America, grew up as a Muslim, that they can find something that resonates? There's no doubt. There's but no how, doubt. Do you, how do you do that? That's the question. How do you do that? I mean, we listen to stories of converts, because we're looking for some light to just switch on like it did for them. Um, is, is that enough? Should we just go around asking every Tom, John, and no, Nick, and Joe, um, how did you become Muslim? Why did you become Muslim? And expect from that, the light will turn on and we'll just, In fact, we'll that follow? In fact, often do more harm than good, I've found. People ask me all the time, why Wait a second, so wait a second. Yeah. The convert stories aren't as helpful as I thought they were? Sometimes they can be detrimental. Okay, why is that? Because they can convince people that they don't have to do anything, that their religion is, is so superior and they've already belonged to it and they've done what they can, that they can go home and they, they, they can go home and sleep good at night because they've, they've done enough. When in reality, what really is going on is that that person needs to, to strive that much more because they've been given a head start. Okay. And this person has come from nothing and has come very far. So uh, let's have some sort of friendly competition with how much we can, we, can, we can strive towards Allah, how much we can obey, how much we can learn, you know. Uh, what about this? Um, I hear this quite often, and I want to get your feedback, because I'm always asking people the similar experiences, what they think when they hear, um, you're a convert to Islam. Uh, you are much better than me. You are, um, you, 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 you appreciate Islam more than I do. What do you what what runs through your mind when you hear that kind of thing? So it doesn't have to be. That I mean, way. it's 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 definitely coming from what I feel from most people like a very sincere place yeah. and uh, kind of an expression of happiness and joy for you. Yeah. But do you ever get the feeling that like it it almost seems like a it is what it is kind of thing? Cop out. Cop out. Yeah. I think it's a cop out. Yeah, I think it's cop out sometimes. I think. Like, that, well, you're going to appreciate Islam, <laughs> and I'm just going to kind of yeah, hang out and just there's wing no it. There's no reason. There's no reason to. Uh, to not to not strive uh, the person the person who Allah says that if you obey him he will teach you and if you try and and strive and try to know who who is Allah who is your creator and if you you try things are going to happen to you it, but it takes effort and it takes it takes sacrifice okay so in closing here um, some advice uh, you are a parent you have, you said, uh, and by, I wanted to ask you this, your, your, your wife and your son, uh, how are they enjoying life overseas? They're not overseas yet. Okay, they haven't made it over there yet, yeah, right? But you're working on that. I'm trying. Okay, there's some requirements to meet. Yeah, bureaucracy yeah. to go through. How are you handling the, the distance? You know, you try to make the best of every situation you're in, right? Okay. Uh, everybody who's, told, who's talked to me, who's going through that before, they said, listen, you're never going to have this kind of time. Try to take advantage of it while you have it, even though it's hard. And it is hard. It's hard to be disciplined, and it's hard to regulate your time. It's even, it's almost harder having more time because there's more time to waste. Oh, okay. If you, if you bat, yeah, if the you pressure's bat. not there. Exactly. Yeah. So you have to be very disciplined. So um, let's let's end with this. Uh, some advice that you have as a young parent, as a as a as an adult, right? So you're you. I mean, you're at an age now where you would be, um, if you hadn't taken this route, you would be out in the workforce still. You would be, uh, you know, doing all of that. 
so it's obvious to me what I see is that it's never too you're never too old to learn, right? No, you have to learn even when you're old. It's not even just you can't just say, "Look, I've already learned these things. I've no. heard this before." No, you have. I, to I learn. heard this in grade school. You have to learn. I mean, it's it's a it's a trust, and it's a, it's it's directly, especially here in the West, and that's the thing. I mean, being in this community, and having been part of this community, and having had the the opportunity to help uh, start up the, the youth group for the guys and everything like that. I think that the average parent here severely underestimates how much pressure their child is under to abandon the song. Severely underestimates it. I came in here the last time I rode through town and they had, Angel was doing a little discussion with, with the guys and there were maybe 30 kids there and I asked them. Angel's our uh, youth yeah. director by the way. And I asked, I asked, I, I, I asked uh, who here has been called a terrorist? Everybody's hands in here. Your kid's going to be called a terrorist. You live in the United States. You're Muslim. The kids are going to be called a terrorist. Multiple times. From when they're young. The pressure on them to give up their religion is enormous. And just because you think that they're Muhammad at home, that doesn't mean that they're not Mo in class. Right? They're going to change their name. They're going to hide things from you. They're going to try to get away with, the, with things. I wasn't, even, I wasn't even a Muslim growing up, and I did things for my parents, and it was easy. They've got even more reason, and they're going to do it to you. So you need to be extremely proactive. You need to be extremely proactive about your child's religious identity. And you need to fix yourself. It's fine you need to fix yourself. You need to, to, to really fix your own relationship with your creator and make sure you're doing what you can to lead not just by example, to lead by example first and foremost, and then also to try to strengthen your child's identity before it gets blown away. Because it, it happens. It happens all the time. Well, we're not in Medina, though. I mean, we don't have a hundred lessons to choose from. We don't have what you're experiencing. What are we, I mean, how are we going to do, what are we going to do? I mean, it's, uh, it's, it's... What do, what, what can we do here? There's enough. You have enough opportunities here. And all you have to do is be smart and look ahead and, and prioritize. You know, you should try to be making friends with other Muslim families. You should be getting together with Muslim families outside the masjid. You should be taking an active role in who your child's going to marry. Be taking an active role before they fall in you love mean, with, uh, they fall uh, love with, uh, with, you know, <laughs> uh, daddy I fell in love with an atheist. You mean arranged marriage? Even Come on, I, careful, careful. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Have you gone that traditional? <laughs> Listen, it's, it's, it's that, I, I am someone who did not get married by arrangement. I can tell you from not having, from having parents that were not, from a culture where they take interest in that particular way in who the child is marrying. The child is in no position. They're in no position to make those kinds of, like, just uh, decisions. They can have input. Yeah, of course. Yeah. But to make just a... Uh, I like the hair, I like the eyes, that type of thing's good. They don't have the, the perspective to be able to determine, to, to be able to parse out what's good for me 10 years from now and what I want right now. Oh, okay. And the parent has that ability. So sure. it's a crime for the parent to withhold that perspective from their child. So there's, there's lots of things. You just have to be very proactive and you have to be smart. And no one's saying that you can't have Muslim friends. I've got lots of, uh, of non-Muslim friends and you're going to interact with them. But you have to put your child in a position where they can take their religion with them wherever they go. Not in a position where they're going to hide it wherever they go. Do you think that learning and becoming more aware of your religion is a tool, if you will, to, to, to use, to strengthen that identity? It's the only chance. It's the only thing that I see. Or is it just enough to say we're Muslim, we don't do that? No, that'll never work. That'll never work with kids. Not at all. The kids, they have to learn. They have to understand why. Especially in, in, in America, in the, in the culture they're brought up in, yeah. they ask, why? Why is this? Why is that? What for? What's the cause? Right. And it's not enough as know. a parent to say... That's yeah. what Allah said. And if the parents don't know, guess what? Your, your, your child's going to learn a different story as to why. They're going to learn why when they go to school. And they're going to ask their teachers or ask their friends, why is this? And they'll tell them, well, it's because Islam is, you know. And the, what, will you want to have you teaching your child about Islam or, or society teaching them about Islam? Or their friends teaching them about Islam? Jazakallah khair, Tom. Thank you for your time this evening, uh, for your insights, your sharing stories and experiences. It's been a great uh, reminder for me. And uh, I hope it's been enjoyable for everyone here this evening. Uh, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in closing, uh, he said in authentic hadith, مَن يُرِدِ اللَّهُ بِهِ خَيْرًا يُفَقِّهُ فِي الدِّينَ That whoever Allah wants good and benefit for, then he grants him understanding and knowledge of the religion, of Islam. 
Right? So this is one of the greatest signs and indicators that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants good for you, wants good for your family and your children in that you and Allah gives us the tools and the means. So we're not inept or incapable or unable, but he gives us the means to seek that knowledge and to learn and to benefit ourselves. And when we embark upon that journey and we commit ourselves to it for the long haul, if we find ourselves continuous, then this is min tawfiqillah. It's from Allah's success and it shows us that he wants benefit for us and has not left us alone. So we ask that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless each and every one of us with that benefit and that goodness and that he aid us, that he aid you, Tom, in your studies, um, uh, that he guide you along the way and, 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 and bless you with uh, an abundance of opportunity so that you can uh, come back, which I hope is your intent, to come back and benefit us with what Allah has benefited you with. Um, if you want to follow Tom, our brother here, and a uh, student of the Medina University. Uh, he has a Facebook page. Uh, his, his Facebook is Tom the Talib, right? Okay. You can become one of the followers and he updates regularly what's going on, some pictures, some videos at times, I think, and you can kind of see a day in the life of or follow him. And um, it's through that page that you can also reach out, ask questions, say hello, even uh, offer some support through various means and opportunities. So please, if you're on Facebook, uh, take advantage of that. I know that the feeds are often filled with a lot of different things uh, coming out of sort, but uh, there's no better uh, thing to have in your life than someone who is going to remind you of Allah and the hereafter. So we're going to conclude here. Uh, we've got a few minutes before we're going to pray. Uh, there are some refreshments available, if I'm not mistaken, as was promised. And uh, uh, we can break for refreshments and then we'll give about 10 minutes or so and then we'll stand for prayer, inshallah. Jazakallah khair. Wa sallallahu wa sallam ala nabiyyina Muhammad wa akhir da'wana. Alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen.